that he wanted me to kill him. Jennifer, she's crying. I didn't want to do with her. He said he couldn't spend his life in jail. Somehow or another, it popped into my mind that kill her. And so he wanted me to stab him. The voice just heard came from Jennifer Welts, who was only 14 years old. The man she mentioned was known as the Cherry Hill Killer. On the surface, she hurt him to protect herself. However, the truth of the matter is even more bizarre. Back on October 6, 1995, the police went to Jennifer's residence based on an anonymous call to 911. When they walked into the house, they only found Jennifer sitting alone on the porch, as quiet as a shadow. However, they but it's hard to imagine what he's about to witness inside the house. For years before Jennifer was found, on February 22, 1991, Dee Dee Rosenthal disappeared from her 7th floor apartment, leaving no trace of an intrusion, but more disturbingly, Dee Dee lived next door to Jennifer at that time, now, the Cherry Hill killer is still on the loose, and the only survivor is Jennifer, who is trying to stop him. This is obviously a tragedy, a terrible story coming to a cruel end, before Rebecca Welts and her daughter Jennifer moved into their seven-story apartment building in Cherry Hill, New Jersey, the two endured an unhappy marriage. However, Rebecca was not single for long. She met a caretaker named Eddie who worked in the same apartment building. Soon, Eddie moved into their home, and the two formed a new family. At first he was full of laughter and everything seemed very happy. However, this happy time did not last long. Some of Eddie's strange habits began to emerge. As time went by, his behavior became more and more bizarre, especially when dealing with Jennifer. He became extremely controlling, erratic, and behaved strangely, despite the occasional tricks. Over time Eddie won Rebecca's trust and was even entrusted with taking care of the daughter who stayed at home during weekend work. However, Jennifer suffered abuse at the hands of Eddie. Even at just seven years old, she knew she had to take action and mustered up the courage to confess everything to her mother. However, Rebecca coldly denied everything, claiming that Jennifer was just making things up, but Jennifer understood that Eddie was forcing her to do something. Is wrong, on February 26, 1991, after enduring three years of abuse, Jennifer's family finally moved out of the apartment. Then, the police came knocking on the door and explained that their next-door neighbor had disappeared four days earlier. Police were now an investigation is ongoing into every resident and employee at the building, who had interviewed Eddie earlier in the day and Rebecca told police that Eddie had been at her home all night. The prosecutor couldn't help but notice the fear on Jennifer's face when Rebecca mentioned Eddie. The family had moved out of the apartment before police had a chance to conduct a second interview. And while this may have seemed suspicious, by then many residents had left Somerset House in the aftermath of Dee Dee. That's disappearance becomes confusing, but when police conduct a forensic examination of her apartment, they found the apartment to be immaculately clean, no sign of invasion, no blood, no bullet casings, the bed is as neat as ever, there is no physical evidence, the only valuable clue they found was an $80 cash machine receipt in Dee Dee's diary. But what is even more eye-catching is the testimony of the old lady living alone downstairs. She woke up around 4 in the morning and heard a thumping sound on the ceiling, which was obviously coming from upstairs in Dee Dee's apartment. There were no other suspects or clues in the case, and it was gradually ignored. However, the incident attracted great attention from the American people. Many TV programs and publications reported on the story, including NBC's popular program Unsolved Mysteries, Jennifer felt sorry for Dee Dee and her family in their new home north of Cherry Hill. For most people, the police have done their best, but for Dee Dee's brother Bram, it's not enough. He made 67 trips to Cherry Hill, walking into local bars and restaurants with photos of his sister, always looking for her. As time passes, Brad is caught between his own life and his mission to find his sister, but in the end, his persistence prevails there. Brand is getting more and more depressed, and so are Jennifer and Rebecca. Since they moved there, they understand why Eddie is called crazy. This man is completely out of control and often acts like a child. Even resorting to violence, 
His anger towards Rebecca grew to the point where Jennifer knew that her mother had also been abused by him, even though she didn't see it with her own eyes. Jennifer felt that as long as her mother resisted at all, he would go crazy. She had personally experienced Eddie's seven years of abuse, and now her mother was also implicated. She understood that she could not go on like this, so after a quarrel, Jennifer finally convinced after Rebecca left Eddie, they had made plans in advance, but Rebecca made a fatal mistake. She told Eddie, Jennifer's last day of school was over and Rebecca told her to pack all her things and promised to meet her in the school playground at 6 p.m., right after her last hockey game. Jennifer left the court and saw her mother's car parked there, but Eddie was sitting in the driver's seat. She immediately yelled angrily, knowing that this might happen, why did her mother never keep her promise? The mother just said, Jennifer, get in the car. There was silence in the car, and the tension could be felt. Jennifer noticed Eddie's eyes in the rearview mirror. Although she was not sure, she felt that the situation was very bad. Once they got home, Eddie claimed that he just wanted to have dinner as a family one last time, but Jennifer felt very uneasy. Eddie tried to explain, then insisted that he needed Rebecca's car to go shopping, and before she knew it, he was scurrying out the door, taking the car keys with him, and just like that, they were stuck there. Jennifer trying convinced her mother to leave before he came back, but Rebecca wouldn't listen. During a heated argument, Jennifer retreated to a room upstairs. Later, she fell asleep without realizing it. She slept for several hours. Late at night, a loud noise suddenly woke her up. It was about 2 a.m. and Jennifer knew something was wrong. She got up hastily and started walking down. As she got closer, the noise became clearer and louder. On the way, she realized what was happening. That was the sound of Eddie punching his mother in the face, but it was too late. Before she could react, Eddie stopped suddenly. He turned to her with anger on his face. Eddie then grabbed Jennifer by the hair and dragged her into the living room. Eddie threw Jennifer on the chair and Rebecca was lying next to the sofa. Then, he turned around and picked up a small axe from the ground. Jennifer began to panic as Eddie slowly walked towards her, Jennifer with a thin sheet. Under the sheets, Jennifer could hear her mother's breathing and knew her mother was still alive, but seconds later, Eddie began attacking Rebecca with an axe. Those heavy blows will always remain in Jennifer's mind. After a while, Eddie pulled the sheets away and took Jennifer upstairs. Eddie dragged her into the bedroom and subjected Jennifer to the most brutal torture. It lasted four or five hours. As the sun rose, Eddie suddenly stopped and sat next to Jennifer. The questions he asked made Jennifer feel very uneasy. Eddie actually asked Jennifer to kill him or else he would kill her. Faced with this impossible dilemma, Jennifer summoned up the courage to try to guide Eddie toward a third option. Like a negotiator, Jennifer eased the tension and calmed Eddie down. By listening carefully, asking questions without judgment, and showing understanding, Jennifer slowly convinced Eddie to let go of her, and of himself, Eddie hesitated, stood up, and walked back and forth in the bedroom with an axe in hand. He seemed to gradually realize what he had done. When everything seemed unfavorable, Jennifer successfully persuaded Eddie to surrender. Then there was the scene at the beginning of the video, the police arrived at the scene and quickly separated Jennifer and Eddie. Next, their main focus was on Rebecca. James Wonka, the prosecutor involved in the case, recalled that when the police asked Eddie about Rebecca's whereabouts, Eddie's reaction was unusual. When the police asked her if she needed an ambulance, his response was bizarre, no, it's too late now. At the police station, Detective Gabriel Malloy, who interrogated Eddie four years ago, is once again on the offensive. Eddie's and Jennifer's accounts of events generally agree, however, after Eddie fully confessed to the murder of Rebecca and the violation of Jennifer, there are still more secrets waiting to be revealed. Next, they began asking again about the disappearance of Dee Dee Rosenthal. To the shock of prosecutors and detectives, Eddie confessed everything immediately. After four years of silence, the truth finally emerged. In this way, the two cases fell into the hands of prosecutors in Cherry Hill and Burlington. 
However, after the first meeting with the lawyer, Betty immediately retracted all confessions. Even if he did not do so, the confession alone was not enough to determine the verdict. His guilt, according to New Jersey law, is that confession is not enough to convict him of the crime and must be proven by additional evidence. This was very crucial during the ordeal of 1991. Although Eddie had tried to clear all traces of his involvement in Dee Dee, past murder, he had forgotten one small thing, the automatic car that the police found under the cover of Dee Dee, that schedule. The cash machine receipt, he clearly told Cherry Hill detectives that he took $80 out of that wallet, and ultimately the key to the confession was that receipt. Due to Jennifer's survival, the first trial went very quickly. After hearing her testimony, the jury took less than 40 minutes to announce the guilty verdict, including the murder of Rebecca and the violation of Jennifer, Betty's sentence to life imprisonment. Meanwhile, prosecutors in Burlington are preparing for a second trial, seeking not only a double life sentence for Dee Dee's murder but also the death penalty, thus avoiding the prospect of abolition of the death penalty in New Jersey. Another trial was considered a wise decision after Eddie's confession was withdrawn. There was a strong possibility that he would be acquitted, and his attorneys used all the clues and false findings that the police collected after Diddy has appearance on Unsolved Mysteries to try to mislead the public, let them believe that Diddy was still alive and had just chosen to leave her family and start a new life. This statement was clearly not accepted, although Jennifer and Diddy as brother brand cheered the victory. However, it was not until 2004 that review evidence from the trial revealed that the jury foreman had made an error in his comments to the jury. This error was enough for the court to request a new trial, and New Jersey was on the verge of abolishing the death penalty. Considering that the death penalty was about to be abolished, it was considered a wise decision to avoid another trial, so prosecutors proposed Eddie a deal in which he would admit to killing Dee Dee in exchange for a life sentence. Ultimately, Betty was convicted in the summer of 2005. Was sentenced, 10 years had passed since his first arrest. Betty's crime was finally revealed, and he was sentenced to double life imprisonment without any possibility of parole. His murder of Dee Dee and Rebecca, and his violation of Jennifer were all confirmed, but for Dee Dee's it's not a perfect ending for the family, they still can't find Dee Dee's body, they still can't give her a decent burial, they still can't fully let go, they still can't fully forgive, they can only rely on Eddie's words to imagine Dee Dee's last moments, they can only rely on Jennifer's words to feel Jennifer's pain, they can only rely on their own beliefs to find their own comfort. They are a group of strong people, a group of people who do not give up, a group of real family members.